Good morning. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started. We have a couple of our fourth years here today. Uh, first is Zach Oki. Uh, interesting fact about Zach is that he's fluent in Armenian. Uh, he says that he's going to give his presentation in English. So uh, he's going to be talking to us about keratoconus. Thanks for that intro, Dan. Uh, very pleasant intro. Yes, I will not be giving this talk in Armenian. Um, I don't know if I remember it well enough to actually be super fluent. But, um, so today I'm going to be giving a case presentation first on keratoconus, and then I'm going to describe in some detail the disease, diagnostic criteria, et cetera. Um, so let's start with the case. Um, so my patient is a 26-year-old male. He has a history of keratoconus that was diagnosed about five years ago. He came into clinic because um, he said his cornea had ruptured. Um, he said that on May 8th, he was at work, got some dirt in his eye, decided to clean it out with his hands, and subsequently developed blurry vision and pain. He saw an outside ophthalmologist who essentially said to him, let's observe this, or we can do a corneal transplant, and wanting a more conservative therapy, he decided to visit us and see what we could do for him. Um, as, as described in the nurse's notes, he's a longtime eye rubber, um, definitely has pain, a little phob photophobia, um, and no family history. This is his physical examination, excuse me, <laughs> when we saw him when he came into clinic. Um, his visual acuity, as you can see on the left eye, is quite uh, affected, whereas on his right it is not necessarily. Um, he could see, though, he, he, uh, he could see through this. This is uh, the affected cornea. You can see there's sort of a nuclear predominance, um, white finding. Um, this is his left eye. Um, as I described earlier, you can sort of see the people, everything around his eye was essentially normal, clear cornea in the periphery. So we decided to obtain ocula, uh, optical coherence tomography. This is a technology that's common to the keratoconus and corneal fields. Um, you get a high resolution of corneal thickness by shining infrared light into the cornea and get a high resolution image back at you. Um, taken at different angles, this is a three-dimensional structure, of course, and um, here we have two-dimensional views. The arrow that I've added to these images denotes Decimase membrane, um, the uh, second to last layer of the cornea. So you can see this normally is a, uh, this is normally a, uh, a thin structure, as we all sort of know. Um, however, in his case, it is bulged out. You can see vacuoles of edema. There's one large vacuole um, just uh, above Decimase membrane in his case. This is a close-up view of this top left image. You can see how significant his uh, edema is. In cases of keratoconus, this is known as high drops, which I'll be discussing in some detail later. So, um, on advisement from my mentor attendings, I would like to get some audience participation if possible. Um, please, any senior residents or any fellows who'd like to inform us on what would be the next best step, please raise your hand if I'd like some help. What would you do? Muro, okay, that's one option. That's right. So Miro's one option. Any other options? Miro, of course, is a hypertonic saline that can be administered topically. Um, here are your options. So uh, these are not necessarily discrete. They can be used interchangeably or all in combination. Um, laser peripheral iridotomy in combination with intracameral gas will actually uh, replace decimase membrane back onto the most inferior layers of the stroma, uh, thereby preventing further development of edema and, and uh, promoting regression. The iridotomy I is there so that if the gas is, for whatever reason, displaced, that won't cause a glaucoma. Hypertonic saline, as Tom mentioned, or Muro, can be used. Topical antibiotics are also used because there can be a uh, um, a traumatic association with eye rubbing in cases of high drops, um, exacerbated keratoconus, cyclopegics, corticosteroids, as well as ocular hypotensives to 
uh, decrease the um, fluid inside of the anterior chamber. Um, so these are the options that we had for this patient on our initial visit. We decided to do an LPI as well as um, sulfa uh, hexafluoride gas. The other option of, of gas um, is perfluoropropane. Both are readily absorbed, both are safe. Um, as Tom mentioned, Miro, Durazol, and Acetazolamide, a carbonic anhydrase, anhydrase or a hypotensive agent is what we used. Here's an image of us in the um, operating room. Here we're injecting um, sulfahexafluoride into his anterior chamber in the hopes that Decimase membrane will stay attached. Um, we instruct the patient after this happens to lie in one degree Trendelenburg, reverse Trendelenburg after the operation so that the gas is uh, nicely maintained on top of the uh, inferior portions of the cornea. So on post-op day one, we saw this patient and he, the edema was improving. He still had some pain. Um, his visual acuity was actually worse. He had count fingers than on his initial visit, which was 2300. Um, the bubble, this is my inadequate representation of a bubble inside of an anterior chamber, my apologies. H representing high drops. The high drops was still present, 40% um, SF6 in, in his anterior chamber. So we decided to start Vigamox, discontinue ocular hypotensives, and continue Muro and Trendelberg, and then follow up in nine days. Um, at that visit, his edema was improving. He didn't have any pain, which was an excellent indication. Um, and his visual acuity improved from his initial visit when we saw him, which was, um, so he gained 100 feet. And there was no gas. So um, before we wanted to change our treatment plan, we decided to collect more information. We did another um, OCT, and this is his cornea, which is quite excellent compared to when he initially came in. So as you can see, there's marked improvement. Um, little, little edema still present, Decimase membrane is visible, but a definite improvement. This is at this, taken at the same angle. So we decided to reinflate with SF6 gas and continue all of the treatments that we that I previously mentioned. He, can, he returned in two weeks. He said he could see some. This patient is a pleasant gentleman. He tends to minimize certain benefits, I think, from our therapy. Uh, he came in holding his eye, and when he came in on this visit, he was pleasant and able to sort of look at things around the room. Um, his edema was, was improving, and his, his pain continued to not be existent, and the bubble that we had placed was gone. His high drops um, opacity had been improving as well as you can see in this image. Definite um, significant um, improvement in the opacity that we saw on initial presentation, which is this, this is his initial presentation. So by comparison, you can see marked improvement. Um, and this is the OCT that we captured at this last visit, which is by my naive medical student eye, looks like a normal cornea. <laughs> And this is his um, OCT on initial presentation. So definitely a large improvement. You can, Decimase membrane is right here, whereas it's, it's right here <laughs> on his last visit to us. So let's, let's discuss keratoconus mildly. Uh, just the, the disease and uh, we'll touch on management a little bit. So first keratoconus, it's a non-inflammatory disorder um, of tecton corneal stromal tectonic weakness. Um, there are two hallmarks, thinning and conical deformity that leads to an irregular astigmatism. Um, typically, it will present in the second or third decade, but in puberty, you can actually see um, initial thinning um, associated with the disease. There are some classical features in physical exam, slit lamp examination that I'll discuss briefly, and the severity of the disease will obviously determine therapy. Pathophysiology is an interesting discussion. The literature is full of arguments. Um, there are certain things that we know, and there are certain questions that have yet to be answered. Um, one thing is for sure, collagen content is reduced. And I will show some histo histologic issues, uh, excuse me, pictures, that will, I think, convince you that it, this is a ve very special thinning. Um, the cascade hypothesis states that um, the keratocytes, which are the cells found in the corneal stroma, for whatever reason, cannot react well to oxidative stress. There are certain um, enzyme inhibitors that are um, significant in 
the reaction to oxide radicals that are formed by light that hit our cornea. And for whatever reason, in patients with keratoconus, these enzyme inhibitors tend to be deficient, and that leads to a cascade of effects, namely corneal thinning. Genetics plays a role both directly because of familial association. About 20% of patients with keratoconus will have a fa familial association. But there are certain other genetic conditions, for example, trisomy 21, that will predispose patients to oculodigital stimulation, which is another thing that we know is associated with um, high drops and keratoconus. There are certain inflammatory mediators that have been well described that lead to corneal thinning. But we don't know the hierarchy of, <coughs> excuse me, of any of these. So we don't know, is there one enzyme? Are there many enzymes that are most responsible? Um, excuse me, enzyme inhibitors. How important is genetics? It seems to be important to some, but not to others. There's a penetrance issue. Um, so we still have a lot of questions to answer. Um, as I mentioned, I would show a histologic image. You can, so this is uh, a uh, cross section, not excuse me, a cross section, but a, a flat section of corneal uh, tissue. In the periphery, there's normal sort of thickness. And then as you, uh, as you move to the center, there's a marked demarcation and then thinning begins. There's a physical exam property associated with that, which I will mention momentarily. As happened with our patient, um, Decimase membrane be can separate from the cornea, leading to high drops. If untreated with observation, um, the cornea can develop scarring, which is seen in this patient by the significant H&E um, stain. So this is a disease of the life of the lifetime, um, as I mentioned, beginning in puberty, presenting in the third and, and second decade with visually significant uh, symptoms. Along the way there, there are all sorts of visual changes. Most of the pubertal patients are um, incidentally discovered. However, uh, along their lifetime, uh, with variable penetrance, uh, patients can present with different features, modified visual changes, axis shifts, there are different um, reflexes, different um, physical exam features, which I will mom mention momentarily, but some have a temporal significance as a patient progresses. There are different degrees that have been described in the European Journal. For that reason, visual acuity is described in meters here. My apologies. <laughs> uh, but the degrees of, of keratoconus are associated with both curvature, visual acuity, and thickness of the, of the cornea, um, usually pubertal or uh, uh, pre, uh, patients initially pre presenting are first degree or zero degree, or they haven't been diagnosed yet. So these are some external, f some findings on physical examination that I wanted to mention. I only mentioned a couple of these in our, um, in our discussion here today. Most prominent among external findings, most classic in the, in the textbooks is Munson sign. This patient is probably a first degree um, keratoconic. Um, his left eye is affected. Um, for comparison, this is a patient probably in later stage degrees. His, you can see marked uh, changes in his cornea, V-shape, classic sign, Munson sign. Corneal thinning is, of course, by definition, a, a part of keratoconus on slit lamp examination. You can see sort of normal uh, cornea and then marked thinning in the center and inferior portions of the cornea and then return of normal cornea, so to speak. Volkstria is important both in the pathophysiology um, and in identification of the disease. I, it's difficult to see here, but I mark them with circles. This is physiolog physiologically <coughs> significant because where high drops occurs, um, high drops occurs at the Volkstria. This is the uh, area of the cornea where there is highest degree of weakness. Um, Flesher's ring is another interesting feature. As I mentioned, there's a marked, demarcated thinning, and the, um, the tear film aqueous layer of the front part of the cornea will <coughs> collect iron deposits, hemosiderin deposits, and will uh, demonstrate this ring um, shape. This is a patient with, um, who had a cornea transplant, and the cornea is sitting on the OR bench. A scissor reflex, you shine di direct light into the retina and it reflects back to you with an irregular astigmatism. Interesting um, physical exam feature. 
There are other automated uh, things that you can see inside of the clinic by photokeratoscopy and video keratoscopy. Um, photokeratoscopy is well, un well understood. We obtain in the, in the clinic all the time. This is a normal patient. Uh, this uh, keratoconic patient showing the classic egg-shaped mire. You'll notice inferior temporal mires are uh, the distance between them is reduced, whereas in a, nor excuse me, in a normal patient they're all equidistant. Um, video keratoscopy is being used more and more for diagnosis and is associated with formal diagnostic criteria. These patients have a normal sort of, this is a normal sort of range for uh, pa any patient coming in, whereas a keratoconic will present with this classic video uh, keratoscopic uh, presentation with, uh, with a, um, a focus, as seen in our patient, if you remember his, uh, just his external physical exam, this sort of matches that uh, with uh, inferior predominance. Um, video keratoscopy is very important, we'll discuss in a moment, but this is, these are the, the signs that we would use to clue in a diagnosis. Um, there's a, uh, a clinician in UCLA no, uh, with the name Rabinowitz who is, um, has published greatly on this subject. He developed a set of formal criteria. There are also modified criteria that you can use in clinic. Here I'll be talking about the formal um, extended criteria. There are four components of it. Um, central corneal steepening as is typical of keratoconics. Um, the um, diopteric asymmetry that we saw in video keratoscopy, degree of irregular astigmatism and regular corneal astigmatism that we can see in the clinic. Using these four components, um, Rabinowitz was able to stratify with high um, certainty different patients in order to say, is this a person with keratoconus, is this person not? Those who um, um, fell, and I will describe how to uh, calculate these numbers, um, but patients who have numbers from 60 to 100 percent are suspected keratoconics. However, above 100 percent definitely have early or and above that advance. Those below 60 have normal. So how do you develop these numbers? This is known as the KISA number. I understand this is sort of a daunting equation. There aren't a lot of mathematicians in the room, but um, the K value is well known to us, central corneal steepening. Um, inferior superior value is, uh, is an interesting uh, way of uh, noting diopteric asymmetry. There are different ways that you can look at video keratograph, which I won't go into detail here, but um, skewed radial axis and as astigmatic index, different, these three, you use video keratograph to uh, find numbers in order to plug into this equation, as I mentioned using 60 to 100 as sort of a mid-range and above 100 uh, gives you a s almost a certain diagnosis of keratoconus. So management, I've already alluded to all this. The main goal of high drops is to reduce edema from the corneal stroma. Um, there are ways that we can go about that by either um, putting a hole inside of the iris and then, as I mentioned, placing decimase membrane to um, stop diffusion of fluid into the corneal stroma. Hypertonic solution to extract fluid from the edematous tissue. Cycloplegics um, and hypotensives to reduce the um, fluid burden inside of the anterior chamber. And this is my presentation. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Ambadi, Tom Oberg, and Steve Christensen who helped me with this presentation. And uh, thank you for your attention. I will take any questions that you have. Yes, Dr. Olson. <coughs> so it's a very nice summary in regards to this interesting disease. Um, it turns out that it's really high in that way for a mass injury of the corneal collagen collapsing. <coughs> the person who collapses the collagen collapses the overall progression of the disease and the duration of the disease and the outcome of the disease is going to be quite different than the person who has the disease. Which is an amazing result. 
those comments. Yes, Dr. Taven. Thanks, guys.